Okay. Hello and welcome to episode 98 of Question and Answer. I am your host, as far as I can tell, Panyo Basa. Although whether I really am Panyo Basa or not will be addressed in a question that's a little, little ways down on the scroll here. We've got a fairly large number of questions to answer, so I suppose I better just open a beverage here. Take a drink of said beverage. Ah, and commence to answering questions. So, the first question is from Rin Chen. And Rin Chen said, Could you please clarify if the Paritas are the same as the Dharanis used in Mahayana and Vajrayana? Is their function like some sort of incantation or spell? What is the mechanics behind these practices that produce such kind of results? Well, I guess it's kind of like a two questions here. Like, um, let's see, are they the same as Dharanis? And I'm no expert. I've got to separate this into two questions, possibly three. We'll, we'll see how it goes. But the first question is, could you please clarify if the Paritas are the same as the Dharanis used in Mahayana and Vajrayana? And I'm no authority on Dharanis, and I'm not exactly sure what the definition would be other than it's a kind of incantation or mantra that has a certain amount of power to it that people recite in order to release that power. And whether that's the same as a Parita in Pali, I'm not 100% sure. I assume some of the Dharanis would be like, um, in the Pragna Paramita literature, it, they went through a phase in, where like the end of a, a sutta or a sutra would have like a, like a mantra, like gate, gate, paragate, parasangate, bodhisvaha. And so... Um, it's not exactly the same as that. Paritas in Pali, um, some of them are suttas just right out of the, the Tipitaka, like the Metta Sutta is, is probably the best known Parita that is chanted for the sake of blessing houses and so forth. Um, so... I assume there's a lot of overlap, but I don't think it's it's like completely the same. Like a, a Parita in, in Theravada Buddhism and a Dharani in Mahayana Buddhism. I assume there's a lot of overlap, but I don't think they're exactly the same. Like a Parita, for the most part, is designated as a kind of sutta. Sometimes it's apocryphal, not found in the Tipitaka, but still it's considered to be a kind of sutta that... Um, it has benefit from chanting it, certain kinds of benefit. Like uh, Metta Sutta is mainly for the purpose of like appeasing malevolent beings. Or like the Angulimala Sutta is especially um, for the purpose of helping women who are having difficult childbirth. Or the uh, the Fish King Jataka, which is the, the, the Macha the Macha Raja Sutta is especially for the sake of uh, dealing with drought. Like in central Burma, where there's a drought like every other year, it seems like sometimes the monks will get together during drought years and they will chant the Fish King Jataka as a kind of parita, which will hopefully cause it to rain soon. And uh, I don't know if. In Mahayana Buddhism, the Dharanis work that way. Maybe some of them do. But like Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasangate, Bodhisvaha. I'm not sure if it's chanted for a particular purpose other than just to release some sort of spiritual power in general. I'm not exactly sure if it's used as, as a tool for a specific purpose like like some of, or most of the Pali Paritas. Uh, the Kanda Sutta, for example, it's it's actually um, mentioned in in Vinaya. The Buddha 
teaches the Kanda Sutta to monks so that they won't get bitten by snakes. And if they do get bitten by snakes, they won't die from the snake bite. So, um, I guess I should just move on to the next next question from Rinchen, which is actually like part two of his multi-part question here. So, is there function like some sort of incantation or spell? What is the mechanics behind these practices that produce such kind of results? Well, some of the paritas, maybe all of them, work, uh, I mean, according to the theory, through the power of truth. For if you are uttering a powerful truth, then um, you can use the power of that truth to accomplish things, almost almost like a magic spell, like Angulimala Sutta. For those of you unfamiliar with Angulimala, he was a serial killer. He had killed, uh, what was it, 99 people. He was The Buddha was going to be his 100th victim. And then the Buddha, through psychic means and also just through wisdom, converted him to Buddhism. Angulimala um, renounced his life of, of violence and became a, a monk and actually became fully enlightened. So one day, Angulimala is, is walking for alms through the village, and he hears there's this woman who's having a difficult childbirth. So he stands outside of her hut or her house and makes this asservation of truth. And I don't remember the exact words, but it's, it's essentially, you know, since he converted to Buddhism and became a monk, he has not harmed any living being. You know, he was a serial killer before that, but since he converted to Buddhism and became a monk, he has not harmed any any living being, and by the power of this truth, you know, may this woman be well. And that's essentially how it works. And I'm not exactly sure what exactly the mechanics are of how uttering a profound truth is going to give you the power to say, by the power of this truth, may such and such happen. But that's the way some of the paritas, at least, are supposed to function. Um, I think in general, monks will chant paritas, um, just for the sake of emanating blessings and emanating good vibes, you know, good juju to sort of bless the area. And that's, that's good enough. And I assume in that case, it wouldn't be so much the power of truth since really most of the monks who are chanting parita aren't even really thinking about the meaning of what they're chanting. They just memorized the Pali, they might not even really understand the Pali, and they might be thinking about other stuff while it's just mechanically coming out, sort of like rotating a prayer wheel or something. So in a case like that, um, they just think just the power of Dhamma has like a power to just bless the area and dispel malevolent forces and so forth. And exactly how Mahayana Dharanis are supposed to operate, you know, what, what their mechanics is, mechanics are, I don't know exactly. So I've kind of answered this one. I've like halfway answered it. I've semi answered the question. And so I guess I'll just move on to the next one. I'm sorry to wrench in if I did not fully answer the question, but I do not fully understand. And probably most people do not fully understand how it is that Parita works and, you know, how it is that the power of truth can accomplish, you know, like metaphysical or like paranormal feats. And with regard to Mahayana Dharanis, I really am I'm no expert on that anyway. So I guess I'll just move on to the next question. This is from Oyalt. And Oyalt asks a very practical question. Is there a time or deadline for questions? I always feel I am writing very close to your recordings. Well, as a general rule, I do my Q&A videos on Saturday afternoon. Usually between, I'll start like between two and like five. And then it usually lasts for like two and a half hours or so. So um, if you want a question to be answered in the next Q&A, you should ask, ask the question, um, by, say, you know, before 2 p.m. Eastern time in the United States, because I'm almost on the East Coast. I'm in Eastern time. 
So I don't know how that would translate into Greenwich Mean Time or anything like that. You're just, you're just going to have to figure it out for yourself. But if you ask a question and it's too late, you know, I've already started doing the Q&A and then I see the question, then it winds up like at the top of the list on the next one. So it will get answered. It just will get answered a week late. So I'll just move on to oil's second question here. I can't recall, but did you say you have a book or will release a book about your father? Yeah, my father, um, like the only thing I really inherited from my father's possessions was a, a box of like mimeograph, what do you call it? Stenographer sheets, like stenographer tablets, this kind of thing. And, and some typed sheets, typed manuscripts of stuff my father had written, which included his spiritual autobiography or his paranormal autobiography, which I have already more or less edited. Um, except strangely, the one like stenographer's pad um, that was missing. I mean, there was one missing. So there's like a, like maybe a 10, five or 10 year gap in his autobiography. And I would have to fill that in myself. I would have to write that because it was the, the, the period that is missing in his autobiography is the period when I was a kid living with him. And, you know, I was exposed to a lot of the stuff that was going on. So I could fill in a lot of the blanks with regard to that. But my father did write a kind of occult autobiography. Just sort of uh, explaining, you know, just his strange childhood. And, you know, he grew up in the 1920s, which was, you know, practically pre-modern in certain ways. You know, still, still the, most people had horses and buggies instead of automobiles back then. And, uh, you know, then he, he sort of became an atheist and then got really interested in hypnosis when he was a, a medic in, uh, in the U S army. And, um, then grad, he married this woman who was just very psychic. She had a lot of psychic talent and he sort of converted over into a kind of like animistic occultism. And, uh, yeah, so like the the stories about um, like our our house having a poltergeist and, and like certain events that occurred like when I was a kid and was there. Um, yeah, I could fill that in, but it would take some extra time. I'd have to take time off from work or something and just sit down for a week and write a chapter to a book in order to get the thing published. So it may be a while. So I'm just going to move on to Oyalt's next question which is you mentioned your father didn't like it when you talked to him about Dharma. What was it that he didn't like? Well, we could have like philosophical discussions about Buddhism, but if I would try to preach to him, which kind of implied that his own interpretation of like ethics and so forth were mistaken, which from a Buddhist point of view, they were, but still, um, you know, when a kid's preaching to his dad and kind of implying that his father misunderstands important things about life, um, certain kinds of father, like my father, really, it just kind of rubbed them the wrong way. So I suppose I could have been more diplomatic and just kind of set up some philosophical discussion where we can talk about it in abstract terms rather than referring to him personally as, you know, not understanding how karma works or something. So he was kind of interested in certain aspects of Buddhism and considered himself to be a Buddhist, but his Buddhism was pretty sketchy considering that most of what he learned about Buddhism, he learned from a dead Vietnamese monk channeled through a woman in a hypnotic trance. And the dead Vietnamese monk was his guardian spirit. So, um, let's see, I guess I answered that question. The main thing that he didn't like was sort of me implying that he was mistaken. You know, if I'm trying to, to like correct him with regard to his understanding of karma or ethics or something like that, that was, that was when he would get irritated with me. So I guess I'll just move on to the next question. This is from Mary J. And Mary J says, when a monk is sick, can he eat food in the afternoon? And with regard to 
Red, regular food, like bojana in Pali. No, even a, even a sick monk is not allowed to eat regular food. He's not allowed to eat rice and curry, that kind of thing. Although um, there are five tonics. They're called tonics. At least uh, Ajahn Tanisaro got that as the, uh, the, the established rendering of, of the term that I don't remember what the, what, the, what the Pali word is right now. But they are, they can be consumed by a sick monk, excuse me, in the afternoon or at night. So that would mean, see the five tonics, probably not in the correct order would be oil, ghee, butter, honey, and molasses or sugar. So um, a sick monk can consume that sort of thing. And in Burma, they have this stuff called sedumadu, the four sweets or the four honeys, which uh, is a combination of, let's see, sesame oil, uh, palm sugar, probably ghee and, and honey. And you can just eat it with a spoon. Um, or you can just eat jaggery, which is like lumps of palm sugar, that sort of thing. But um, even a sick monk is not allowed to eat like fruit or you know, bread, any kind of regular food in the afternoon. So, but you are allowed to eat sugar and so forth. Just uh, as a source of calories, I guess. So I'll just move on to the next question here. Also from Mary J. And that is, what about the live on number 100? Can you give us initial date and time? Well, um, the, the tentative plan is to do a live stream for Q&A number 100, which is two Q&As from now. And uh, probably I would do it at the same time as I usually do a Q&A, which would be Saturday afternoon, my time. Um, although it may be... I could do it on Sunday, which is usually, I usually uh, post a QA, and a you know, relatively early the following Sunday. So it'd be Saturday or Sunday. And uh, I still have to work it out. I, I haven't done a live stream on, on YouTube yet. So I'm going to have to do like a trial run and just see if it works and everything. But um, yeah, the initial date and time would be probably two weeks from now which would be number 100 and it would be saturday afternoon or maybe earlier a little earlier on sunday um depending on any feedback i get i guess or just you know whatever the situation happens to be so i guess i'll just move on to mary j's third question here which is why would it be possible to kill an arahant but it's not possible to kill the Buddha. And that is, uh, it's, it's sort of like a mythology that I really don't think that this has a foundation in empirical objective fact. That this is one of the symptoms of the, the Buddha cult, where the Buddha was, and probably Jesus was like this too, to some degree. But I think the Buddha became enlightened and he just he, he he was just enlightened i mean that's it you're just either, you're either enlightened or you're not according to theravada buddhism although i guess theravada buddhism has like different levels because the ancient indian mind was so analytical that it was always trying to divide stuff up into into parts and so forth and come up with all of these different gradations and and so on and always trying to outdo whoever had some theory of what is the ultimate, then some other philosopher would come up with something even higher than that. And then someone else would come up with something even higher than higher than that one, just because that's the way ancient Indian philosophers operated apparently. But I do think the Buddha himself was essentially an Arahant and it was glorification of the Buddha, largely through Jataka stories that I'll get to later. Um, it's just sort of making him way beyond an ordinary enlightened being, even though, <clears throat> according to Abhidhamma, wisdom is just the absence of delusion. Panya and Amoha are the same. Wisdom is the same as non-delusion. 
And if you're fully enlightened, you have zero delusion, which means this enlightened being and that enlightened being, this enlightened being might just be a dry vision to Arahant. That enlightened being might be Samasam Buddha, but still they both have the zero delusion, which means they both have the same level of wisdom. At least with regard to liberating wisdom. It may be that the Buddha was like intellectually and intuitively, creatively a kind of genius. And so he had, um, he was more skilled at explaining things. And maybe he had certain psychic powers that certainly a dry visioned Arahant, an enlightened being with no psychic powers, would not have. And he'd be able to use that to like look into a person's mind and see how best to help them that sort of thing but still like at the at the level of spiritual wisdom you know it's like all enlightened beings are the same with regard to that because they all have zero delusion so this idea that you can kill an arahant and some arahants did get killed like mahamogalana one of the two chief disciples of the buddha was, according to tradition, literally beaten to a pulp by a, a mob of angry non-Buddhists. Whereas, according to tradition, a Buddha cannot be murdered. The worst you can do to a fully enlightened Buddha is to cause him to bleed, which Devadatta did. He tried to kill the Buddha by pushing a boulder off a cliff onto him. And when the boulder was coming to, crashing down the, the side of the cliff, a splinter broke off and it hit the Buddha's foot and caused the Buddha's foot to bleed. So, I mean, that, that's enough to, to send Devadatta to hell. Not just the intention to kill the Buddha, but actually making him bleed is one of the five things, sometimes one of the six things, that was just a guarantee of hell. But <clears throat> I really am skeptical a lot of the skeptical with regard to a lot of the mythological embellishments of Theravada Buddhism, which includes the glorification of the Buddha, which includes a lot of suttas, like the Mahasihanada Sutta, where the Buddha is just sitting there just bragging, just grandiosely. You know, he'd put Donald Trump to shame with regard to just the grandiose scale of his boasting. And just encouraging people to worship him, that kind of thing. And I can imagine that that is more a matter of later Buddhists glorifying the Buddha than an actual enlightened being with, with no pride, for example, no conceit, actually saying that stuff himself. So it may be that it is theoretically possible to kill a Samasam Buddha. But, uh, like, tradition has claimed that it is not because they have put the Samasam Buddha way above other enlightened beings. Or just anybody. I mean, the Samasam Buddha is higher than the gods. I mean, it is like the ultimate being in the universe. So that was um, made it sort of a, almost a short step for the Mahayana Buddhists to just convert him into a co kind of cosmic deity. So, um, the question, uh, why don't I get back to the question here? Why would it be possible to kill an Arahant, but is not possible to kill the Buddha? Yeah, it's glorification of the Buddha. Um, the Buddha is supposedly so perfected just over lifetime after lifetime after lifetime after lifetime of perfecting his paramis, you know, these virtues, this list of 10 virtues that any fully enlightened Buddha has to have perfected, you know, over the course of thousands and thousands and millions of lifetimes, that uh, somehow that would make him, his karma would be so purified that he just doesn't have the bad karma to get murdered. I guess that would be the theory. But um, I really don't think that there was such a distinction between a Buddha and an Arahant in the Buddhist time that uh, I, have, I have read in a few suttas at least, an ordinary arahant is called Buddha, and the Buddha himself is called an arahant many times. So, I, I guess I answered that question. It's kind of an academic question for me. I don't think it's 
necessarily dealing with objective matters of fact. <clears throat> but um, maybe it is. And so I guess it would just be that a Buddha has purified himself to such a degree that he no longer has the karma, the latent, you know, residual past karma that could cause him to get murdered, even though he still had bad things happen to him. Like his, his final illness was very painful and, and icky. So I guess I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from Rybalder. And Rybalder said, would you recommend a red letter Suda collection? Red letter Suda collection. Um, Suda is strictly attributed to the Buddha without later commentary. And I probably should have just written up a list. So I'm just going to be dealing off the top of my head here. But of course, the Atika Waga of the Sutanipata, the questions or the answers to the questions in the Parayana Vaga of the Sutanipata. Although the intro and the, the conclusion are considered to be later editions. Certain other suttas, I mean, there's quite a few suttas of the Sutanipata that are very old, although all of them probably are not. Like the Kagawisana Sutta is so old that it has a canonical commentary. The Daniya Sutta, the Sutta on proper wandering, that sort of thing. There's, there's quite a few. And if you read the Sutta, um, you can generally tell fairly well whether it's ancient or not, just based on how much, you know, like, like fairy tale narrative there is, that sort of thing. So let's see. So there'd be that. The uh, Diganaka Sutta, the Majjhima Also the, uh, let's see, uh, Alagad Upama Sutta of the Majjhima It's sort of like a Buddhist, Buddha's greatest hits sutta that it may be that the sutta itself is not extremely ancient, but it contains lots of really good, like meaty discourses that the Buddha gave that it appears to be sort of like a compilation of certain things that the Buddha said, sort of like the, 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 uh, the Sermon on the Mount in the New Testament. It's, it's considered to be sort of like a, a greatest hits or, you know, famous sayings of Jesus that were all sort of lumped together and, and made into one sermon. Also, uh, the uh, Samanya Palasuta of the Diganikaya is considered to be fairly ancient. It's, it's, it's obviously pretty old and it leaves out certain things that should be in there but hadn't been invented yet apparently. Um, a lot of suttas in the Udana are, are very old. Um, let's see. A lot of suttas in the Sagata Vaga of the Samyutta Nikaya <clears throat> are very old. Usually, like, the first suttas in any collection are going to be old and considered to be doctrinally important. And that's why they were put at the beginning. Of, of a like of, of any of the Nikayas, you know, the first suttas of any of the Nikayas are were generally put there by the editors because they were considered to be very important and they were, you, as a general rule, very old. As you get later and later into a into a book or in, into like like the the Majjhima Nikaya or the Diga Nikaya or or something like that, <laughs> that you know, as you get later and deeper and deeper into it, then there's more and more later stuff. But uh, let's see what else. Bahia Sutta of the of uh, the Udana is good. Um, apparently, relatively very old. The Godika Sutta of the Samyutta Nikaya. I can't remember what number it is, but <clears throat> that one's a weird one, which is it's uh, is interesting. Um, the Saka Panya Sutta. If you take away the beginning, the mythological beginning and end, and just deal with the central philosophical part then that is is like a, a fragment that's very ancient um but i mean i can't really come up with a comprehensive list those are just the ones that, that come to mind that i usually mention at times like this so i guess i guess that's good enough for now maybe i should have come up with a list and like s sat there and thought about it maybe done some research or something but i'm lazy so I'm just going to move on to Ray Balder's next question.
which is, I recommended you to a Western Buddhist. He wrote, quote, he cannot use his Dharma name of Panyobasa anymore since he disrobed. That is what I am saying. No, he's irrelevant and will probably have a lesser rebirth waiting for him, unquote. Would you respond to this accusation of Dhamma name misuse? Well, that's kind of an interesting question or request. And the thing is that a Dhamma name is really not found in the texts. That, you know, in ancient India, in the Buddhist time, nobody was giving a, given a new name when they became a monk. You know, it was just whatever your name was, that was your name when you became a monk. So... Um, you know, it was like, if your name was Bob, let's say, or the, like the ancient Indian equivalent of Bob, then you'd become Bhikkhu Bob. I mean, that was it. They wouldn't give you some special, special name. And so it just sort of became a tradition subsequently in a non-canonical manner that someone was given a poly name mainly I, one of the main reasons is because your name has to be mentioned when you are ordained in a, at the ordination ceremony that is recited in Pali. So you have to have a name that can be mentioned in Pali. So you, it would have to have the right, what is it, the noun, what is it, declensions? Like, uh, yeah, I guess it would be, is that, is that the word, the grammatical word, declension? You know, it has to have like the, the right suffixes and everything. It has to be pronounceable in Pali. And it has to, you, you have to be able to put the, the correct endings on it so that it will be objective case or subjective case or accusative case, you know, this kind of thing. Now, there's no objective case. Nominative and accusative and, uh, man, locative. Yeah. It's been a while since I've studied poly grammar, so I'm forgetting the jargon. But anyway, the point is that getting a special poly name is not canonical. It's just a tradition. And the poly name isn't any kind of proprietary thing to the Theravada Buddhist Sangha. So you're given a, a poly name just as a matter of convenience. And I mean, in, in Burma, I knew this one guy, he had a Pali name already. And when he was ordained as a monk, even though he still, he already had a perfectly good Pali name, they gave him a different Pali name. So, I mean, it's just sort of a, a meaningless thing at that point. You know, it's just like blindly following a tradition. There's nothing in the texts that says that if you adopt a Pali name, when you enter the Sangha, that you have to relinquish that Pali name when you leave the Sangha. I mean, there's nothing at all about that. In fact, um, I mean, Uvinia, any kind of rules like that wouldn't even apply to somebody if they left the Sangha, because if they left the Sangha, they don't have to follow the rules anymore. So it's just a name. I don't call myself Panyabasa Bhikkhu because I'm not a Bhikkhu anymore, but most people have known me as Panyabasa in my online presence and so i just continued with it and it's obvious that i can use my dharma name of panyabasa because i'm doing it and there's no statement at all in any of the dipitaka that i'm aware of saying that you're doing anything wrong by being called by the same name after you drop out like in the buddhist time a lot of monks would drop out of the sangha they just kept their their name. It was just the name they had as a monk. Then it was, it was just the name that they had before they were a monk. It was the same name while they were a monk. And it was the same name after they were a monk. And it's just no big deal. It's just not an issue. So with regard to Dhamma name misuse, I mean, that's just a non-issue. I mean, this person is just making it up apparently. And it does seem that he is somewhat, uh, uh, I, I mean, bigoted is kind of an uh, uncharitable un, uh, word, but he seems to think that, uh, you know, it's like if you're not a monk anymore, then, um, you know, it's just you have you have failed and you're inferior and 
and so on and so forth. And that is kind of a traditional attitude, I suppose. But, um, I mean, just to completely diss somebody because they're not a monk is, uh, is just kind of a strange attitude to take. Although, I mean, it's, it's standard in like a Buddhist culture, like in Burma or Thailand or something like that. If you drop out of the monkhood, then, I mean, you're just an ordinary human being again. I mean, in Burma, the word for human being is not used for monks. Monks are considered to be some kind of exalted being, but having a poly name is, I mean, a lot of Burmese lay people have poly names. It's just not a big deal. It's just a word, and I'm not making any claims to be a fully ordained monk or any such thing. So, I mean, if he wants to assume that <clears throat> I am unworthy of having a poly name, then, uh, well, that's his opinion. Also, if he wants to believe that I am irrelevant and will probably have a lesser birth waiting for me, he doesn't really say why I'm going to have a lesser rebirth. I assume by a lesser rebirth, he means that I'm going to be going down after I die, regardless of the 30 years of Dhamma practice and all that. Just mainly just because I didn't change my name back. I mean, at work, I'm not called Panyo Basa, except for very rarely by someone who's joking or something. But um, yeah, I just it's just really not that an issue. It's, it has nothing to do with rules like Buddhist rules in, in texts, at least none that I've ever seen. So I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from Skoladin, or Skuladin. And this, he has a couple, these are kind of strange questions here. The first one is, the never-ending story is a Buddhist allegory. And I have to admit that when I was maybe 19 years old, I saw the never-ending story. I was not impressed by it. And I have forgotten almost all of it. So, um, is the never ending story a Buddhist allegory? Uh, I mean, there was, there's like the dream dragon or something, the luck dragon, I guess he was. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't see it at the time and, uh, it is possible though. I mean, some, there are Buddhist allegories out there that, that you don't really know that they're Buddhist allegories. For example, I was told that some people believe that, um, the Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger was a Buddhist allegory. And I thought that was just ridiculous. That was just silly. And then I read the sequel, the unofficial sequel to The Catcher in the Rye, which is a, a book called Franny and Zooey, also by J.D. Salinger. And that was just clearly a Buddhist allegory. And so it caused me to rethink The Catcher in the Rye. And The Catcher in the Rye probably is a Buddhist allegory. Um, but something like Groundhog Day, I mean, that arguably could be a Buddhist allegory. You just have to do it over and over again. It's like an allegory for rebirth. You have to do it over and over again until you get it perfect. But whether the intention of the, like the, the person who wrote the screenplay and the director and so forth, whether they were deliberately making a Buddhist allegory or whether it's just kind of a coincidence, I don't know. Like there's some Buddhist elements in, in like the first Matrix movie too. And that was probably there on purpose, although it's not purely a Buddhist allegory. I think there's a lot of, I think there's more Christianity in the Matrix than, than Buddhism. Other than the, the little bald kid who's saying, there is no spoon. So, yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I haven't watched The NeverEnding Story in a very long time, like more than 40 years probably. And um, yeah, I really cannot make a statement on that one. So I'll just move on to Skoladin's next question, which is a kind of a similar one. Could the Grinch be considered an enlightened being? And if the Grinch could be considered an enlightened being, then Ebenezer Scrooge also be con could be considered an enlightened being. So it's, it would be like the Grinch after he gets converted to being, to appreciating Christmas, much like Ebenezer Scrooge. Um, it says that, I mean, according to the, the text of the story, the Grinch, his heart grew three sizes, although that could just be a kind of, uh, you know, a kind of disease or something. It doesn't really specify, you know, and just an enlarged heart. But um, yeah, I don't think that Dr. Seuss or 
uh, Charles Dickens really had a concept of enlightenment. You know, they had a concept of being a good person. And that's about as far as it went. So the Grinch and Ebenezer Scrooge, you know, they sort of made the conversion from being a, an asshole to being a, a good person. But I don't think that uh, there's no indication that they were enlightened beings. That they had like transcended some sorrow or any such thing. I don't think that Dr. Seuss and certainly not Charles Dickens had any concept at all of transcending samsara. Charles Dickens in particular was a very samsaric kind of guy. So, I mean, the Grinch could be considered an enlightened being, but whether he really was an enlightened being, assuming that the Grinch really existed, of course, um, is an entirely different question. So, I mean, you could say that the Grinch could be considered an enlightened being by somebody who just was inclined to consider him an enlightened being. But, um, yeah, I don't think that Dr. Seuss really had that in mind when he was writing How the Grinch Stole Christmas. So I'm just going to move on to the next question here. This is from Siovac and Sipad Zidana. And Siovac and Sipad Zidana says, Favorite teacher both Buddhist and non-Buddhist, question mark. Well, I mean, my favorite Buddhist teacher would have to be the Buddha. I guess. I mean, you kind of think that, wouldn't you? My favorite non-Buddhist teacher? Um, I don't know. Maybe Siovac and Sipat Zidana is sort of implying that they would have to be alive or at least modern. In which case, I mean, one of my favorite teachers who's still alive would be Paul Lowe. Um, I don't think he's teaching anymore. He's probably about 90 years old by now. But uh, I, I very much appreciated what he had to say about certain things. So he might be my favorite non-Buddhist teacher. Um, I mean, Neem Karoli Baba up there. I mean, he's definitely, I don't, he's not so much a favorite teacher so much as just a favorite saint a favorite sage. And that's that's different. A sage and a teacher are not necessarily the same guy. Some sages are just, you know, they, they might teach by example in, in, in strange ways, but they might not have any formal teaching like Neem Karoli Baba. I mean, he didn't really teach all that much. You just got uplifted just by being in his presence and hanging out with him. And he would just sort of reflect your karma back at you. I guess that would be a kind of teaching, but it seemed to be spontaneous. It wasn't like, he, he was like doing anything deliberate necessarily. So let's see. Favorite Buddhist teacher aside from the Buddha? Man, that'd be a tough one. I mean, Nagarjuna, of course. He wasn't even Theravadan. Um, gosh. Yeah, I guess I guess that'd be it the Buddha or Nagarjuna as favorite Buddhist teacher. I mean, in modern times, who would be my favorite Buddhist teacher? I'm not even sure. Ram Das taught a lot of Buddhism. I mean, he was like one of my first spiritual teachers, you know, through the medium of books. Most of my teachers have been books, I should say. So it could be my favorite Buddhist book teacher would be like Zen Flesh, Zen Bones by Paul Reps, which uh, kind of converted me to, converted me to Buddhism. Or Nyogen Senzaki, who was the translator of most of it. He was he was uh he, he was an interesting translator because I mean he would just very loosely paraphrase something like a Zen koan. I mean he would not literally adhere to what the koan says, but he was a Zen master himself, apparently, and he would he was able to tell a somewhat different story that has the same effect, which is a credit to him, even though Technically, he wasn't really that great of a translator simply because he wasn't adhering to what it actually said. But still, he was able to sort of create a similar koan in English uh, to the original one in, in like Chinese. So, let's see. So, he'd be like a, a modern Buddhist teacher. I mean, Ajahn Chah was a good teacher. I mean, you read Ajahn Chah's books and I mean, he was teaching from experience. That was something that 
most Burmese Seattos really don't do. They teach by the book. The Burmese are phenomenal scholars and they are just dogmatists. They just adhere to what the book says. That's what they're going to teach you. And if they teach you anything different from what the book says, it's simply because they don't understand it correctly or they, they're trying to kind of put their own spin on what the text says in order to make it a little more in accordance with their own experience, something like that. So somebody like Mahasi Seattle, um, I mean, he may have been a meditation master, but his teachings were not nearly as interesting and engaging and inspiring as like the teachings of Ajahn Chah. So I guess this is just a very long roundabout way of saying that I really don't have a favorite Buddhist and non-Buddhist teacher that I just, there's certain teachers that I appreciate in certain ways, but I don't just say, you know, I don't have a favorite teacher. Like I don't have a favorite football team. So I'm just going to move on to see if action. See Pat Zidano's next question here, which is what would you do? Question mark. And this is in reference to a trolley problem in ethics. And I'm going to have to go to, See if I can find this. Here it is. The Mahayana Buddhist metaphysical trolley problem. A trolley is headed toward five sentient creatures and your generous compassion for all living things causes you to consider your options. You could pull the lever to change the course to hit only one sentient creature, saving five. You know that the principle of karma and interdependent causal origins have caused the trolley to go on its path. Do you pull the lever, thereby entangling your own causal stream with this trolley problem through intention and action, or is your karma already entangled by your being present at the lever? Furthermore, would this action beget negative karmic fruits due to the ending of a life, or would it beget positive karmic fruit due to the effect of saving five people? As an aspiring bodhisattva, would you take on the consequences of potentially negative karma regardless of its effects on your own individual enlightenment or should you just allow the people to die knowing that their causal non-self streams will transmigrate to new bodies thereby potentially preserving your own good karma through inaction okay now i gotta go back to this so it's just the standard trolley problem you're standing there a trolley is headed towards one five people that are tied to the tracks and you can pull a lever and divert it so the trolley will just squish one person. And going with Buddhist ethics, it's very clear what you should do. Just going with Theravada Buddhist ethics, you don't do anything. I mean, you just let the five people get squished. Because if you divert it to squish one person, you've just murdered one person. I mean, you have, you have deliberately caused one person to die. Whereas if five people die, and you don't do anything, then you haven't, you haven't murdered anybody. I mean, nowadays in, in the West with utilitarian ethics and so forth, somebody could say, well, you, you essentially murdered them through your inaction, but Buddhist ethics don't work that way. Inaction is always morally neutral. <sighs> but it's for each person to decide and if I were actually there, I mean, it would depend on the circumstances. You know, it's like, who is the one person that I would be squishing as opposed to the five people that I would just watch getting squished by not doing anything? You know, what would the circumstances be? And, I mean, you'd only have a few seconds. It would be like this intuitive decision that you'd have to make. And it would depend on, you know, the extenuating circumstances at the moment. And I couldn't really predict what I would do in reality. Although I can say very clearly from a Theravada Buddhist point of view, the thing to do is just not pull any levers and just let, let it happen. Because if you kill one person instead of letting five die, you, you've, you've actually, you've murdered one person. So I guess I answered that question. So I'll just move on to Siovaksha and Sipad Zidana's third question here. Thoughts on this composition theory on the origin of the 12 links of dependent origination. Does this make sense? Or do you have any different hypotheses on how these 12 links came to be? And he directed me to 
this statement he was making on the Discord server with regard to how the 12 links of Dependent Core Rising or Padicha Samupada became developed over time. So he and I are assuming that the Buddha himself did not teach the 12 Nidana theory of Dependent Core Rising, that it was something that developed over time. And Siovakshi and Sipat Zidana's hypothesis is that it's based on three different sub-lists that got combined together. And personally, I don't think the evidence supports that. For example, there are proto Padicca Samuppadas you can find in very old texts, like the Attika Waga of the Suttanipata has a proto Padicca Samuppada contained within it in a sutta called the Kalaha Viwada Sutta. And it's similar to the 12 Nidana theory in certain ways. It starts with, man, I don't even remember how it starts. I don't have the link. I don't have the list here either. But it starts with something like perception or papancha sankha. And I mean, that's generally the cause of all fuckery, essentially. The cause of samsara itself is perception, this symbolizing and diversifying the world. And then that, through a series of links, results in all kinds of misery. All kinds of unhappiness and general ickiness. Another um, proto Padicca Samuppada is the central part of the Saka Panya Sutta of the Digha Nikaya that I've already mentioned in this video. So, I mean, if you read those, those are apparently proto Padicca Samuppada, very, um, you know, archaic uh, forerunners of the developed 12 Nidana theory. At least it looks that way to me. I mean, it's, there's obvious, very obvious parallels. And so it probably started, the 12 Nidana theory started with, you know, what is the cause of all suffering? You know, it's not just desire because the desire has a cause. You know, what is it that causes the desire? You know, it's just, uh, you know, dividing up what you like from what you don't like, that sort of thing. What causes that? And that's, you know, like diversifying the world into parts and so forth. So... <clears throat> probably some kind of discourse like that or a number of discourses like that got sort of fixed up. They got doctored up like a, like a store-bought pizza and turned into this developed 12 Nidana theory that uh, it, it does, it's not entirely satisfying. And I mean, dependent core rising is just one of those strange things. It's considered to be central to Buddhist philosophy and just very important philosophically to Buddhism. And at the same time, almost nobody understands it, including the people who developed the 12 Nidana theory and just sort of turned dependent core rising into this 12 links of cause and effect. So, um, yeah, I guess I answered that. I do think that it wasn't originally three different links. It was just sort of a, a simpler series of what causes suffering that then got elaborated upon and probably not in the best possible way. And so now you have people who think that they understand dependent core rising simply because they've memorized the 12 links and they don't really understand that very well. And probably the people that came up with the 12 links did not fully understand dependent core rising either. But enough of that, because I'm moving on to the next question. This is from Homath. And Homath goes by many names. He, he changes his name every few weeks, I think. But his first question is, Kim Nuko Atati. Atati. Which is Pali, it turns out, for does the self survive? And, I mean, it's, it's kind of a weird grammar. I didn't really understand it at first because, let's see, no, Atata. Kim Nuko, Kim Nuko Atata is, is the question. And Atata, it's, uh, I mean, there's different ways you can interpret it, and I interpreted it incorrectly. So he had to explain to me that it means, does the self survive? And this is one of the questions that the Buddha refused to answer. So why he thinks I'm going to answer it, I don't know. But the question is, does the self survive? And if there is no self, 
you've got no self to survive or not survive. So it's, it's, it's just kind of a, an invalid question. So the second question from home math is Kimpana Natata, which means does the self not survive? And if there's no self, then there's no self to survive or not survive. So again, this is like an invalid question, which may very well be why the Buddha just refused to answer these questions. Because by answering the question, then in a sense, you are sort of um, like reinforcing the idea of a self by saying, yes, it does or no, it doesn't. I mean, you're implying that there is a self to survive or not survive. But there is no self according to Theravada Buddhism. So... I guess I answered those questions by kind of unasking them. So Homath's third question may be the, uh, the main question here. In the expression atata, why does the I in ati disappear when conjoined with ata? I would have expected perhaps it would combine with the preceding consonants, consonants and we would end up with achata or something like that, but instead there seems to be no trace of it. So, atata is a combination of two words, ati, which means is, and ata, which is self. So, the self survives, or the self is. And this whole question is like a question of polygrammar, which is going to be of zero interest to very many of you. There might be a few polygrammar geeks out there lurking in the shadows. But for the most part... Um, <clears throat> Most of you aren't really going to care why the I disappears in, in the, the compound word atata. Ati plus ata turns into atata instead of achiata, which you would kind of expect. So <clears throat> this whole process of combining words in Pali is called sandhi, which is spelled S-A-N-D-H-I. And if you look into a Pali grammar towards the back of the book, you know, it's relatively advanced. You have to learn the basics first. And then there'll be a chapter on Sandhi, which is combining or like joining, joining words. And there are these rules about how to do Sandhi, how you combine words. And it depends like on the, 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 the vowels that are going to be joined together. And... <clears throat> Um, so I assume if you really want to know this, the answer to this question, you'd have to find a polygrammer and just study up on Sandhi, again, S-A-N-D-H-I. Just look it up on the internet. You might find it there too. And it will explain this, why it is that when two words are combined, they're combined in a certain way. And I'm just going to move on to the next question here. This is from Mooners. And Mooners says, what do you think of the validity of the bardo? I know Orthodox Theravada rejects the existence of an in-between state between births and deaths. So, you know, the bardo is in Tibetan Buddhism. And it's like this intermediate state after you die. You know, you're in sort of like this realm similar to the realm people enter when they have a near-death experience. You know, it's like, you know, you rise up above your body and you look down and you see your body down there and then you go up towards this bright light and you go through the bright light and then you're in like this heaven realm with like wise teachers and so forth. And that happens in near death experiences. And also according to the Tibetan book of the dead, something very similar to that happens right after you die. So it would be just a DE instead of an NDE. It would just be a death experience. And on the other hand, according to Theravada, there is no intermediate state. I mean, it's like as soon as you die, like in the moment of death, as soon as your thought stream stops in this life, the very next moment, like a trillionth of a second later, it has to start in your next life. But I don't think that there's any law that says you can't go through like a 40 day long spirit existence in between two existences as a human, for example. So it could be that this kind of bardo experience is a kind of spirit existence that doesn't last very long. It can be a kind of transitional state 
And I mean, Theravada Buddhism doesn't really mention it, but I mean, it could be fit into like the Theravada scheme of things. I don't think there's any law in Theravada Buddhism that says you cannot be a kind of advanced ghost for 40 days after you die and then you stop being that ghost and then you, you enter upon your next life as another human being or in a, a heaven realm or whatever. And that during the 40 days as this advanced ghost, you know, this kind of spirit being that you might be like reviewing your life, you might have spirit guides, you know, discussing mistakes you made, things you could have done better, things you did right, that kind of thing. Although, according to the Tibetan Book of the Dead, this is all just mind made. You know, it's all sort of a, a figment of your imagination. So, I mean, that could go with like an advanced ghost existence too, because it seems to me that ghosts, assuming that they exist, that they're really not as aware of an objective reality as we are, that they're kind of like lost in their head. You know, they're like lost in their memories and so forth. And so they're creating a kind of symbolic imaginary world for themselves to some degree, to a greater degree than, than we are, for example. So I do think that it is possible. I don't think it necessarily happens with all people. Just like all people who almost die don't have these near-death experiences. That some of them, they just black out. You know, they, they don't remember anything. So I, I wouldn't say as a Theravada Buddhist or as a person who's more Theravada Buddhist than anything else that, you know, anyone who dies is going to go through this kind of intermediate state. But it's not necessarily against Theravada Buddhism to say that some people, let's say, you know, it's like their next human life, you know, isn't ready yet. You know, they've got certain circumstances that they have to be born into. And so they might be, you know, they might just adopt like this relatively high level ghost realm just to, you know, process their previous life, get ready for the next one, and then and then enter the next life when it's ready. So, um, so that's possible too. So... I mean, and also and to bear in mind that the Bardo realm is largely just mind made, according to the Tibetan Book of the Dead, anyway. That, uh, you know, you might just enter into the spirit realm where you're just sort of like self contained. You're not really interacting with any kind of objective world for, for a while, just kind of processing or whatever. And then you enter the next realm. But it would be, it wouldn't be like an intermediate state. It would just be a short existence uh, as, as a kind of ghost being or whatever in between two more discrete human existences. Something like that. So, I mean, you could sort of fit it in, but I do not think that all people who die go through this, this Bardo realm. <clears throat> Tibetans may be more likely because they're conditioned to expect that after they die. So I'm just going to move on to the next question here. And this is from Mr. Pranav. And Mr. Pranav says, In Angudara Nikaya 5.191, Buddha is comparing ancient Brahmins with dogs. This sutta does not have any context behind it, nor did the Buddha give any conclusion. Some Hindus are using this sutta to tell that Buddha was against intercaste marriage. Why did the Buddha give such a weird discourse? And I have to admit, I don't recall ever having read this discourse before. Excuse me. I'm going to try and blow my nose. My nose has been acting funny during Q&As lately. Uh, see, most people, they would just cut that part out. In fact, I've been watching some videos where I mean, it, some guys, they'll be doing a talk. They'll be sitting here in front of a camera talking. And there, there's like jump edits, like sometimes three times in a single sentence. You know, it's like the jump edits are just every few seconds. And I just don't see the point of it. I, I'm, I'm a human being. I'm just acting like a human being sitting here talking to you guys. And if it doesn't come out perfect, well, 
none of us do really. So anyways, getting back to this strange sutta <clears throat> called dogs in Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. Um, yeah, there's, it starts off with the, the Buddha saying, Bhikkhus, there are these five ancient Brahmin practices that are now seen among dogs, but not among Brahmins. What five? And the first one is that it used to be, see, in the past, Brahmins coupled only with Brahmin women, not with non-Brahmin women, but now Brahmins couple with both Brahmin women and non-Brahmin women. Dogs, however, still couple only with female dogs, not with other female animals. This is the first ancient Brahmin practice that is now seen among dogs, but not among Brahmins. And that's, I mean, it's hard for me to imagine that the Buddha would make an argument like this. Um, it is true that in the Buddhist time in ancient India, there was no formal logic, but it, it's not a very good logical argument here that comparing a Brahmin with a dog in this case, that Brahmins will have sex with women who aren't Brahmins. It's not a very good comparison with dogs not having sex with animals that aren't dogs. It's like, it'd be like different breeds of dog. You know, a Brahmin is a certain breed of ancient Indian human. And whether there were different breeds of dog in ancient India, it might just be that they were all just mongrel pariah dogs. You know, they were all the same breed of dog in ancient India. But it would be more like, a dog that, like a, a cocker spaniel that only has sex with other cocker spaniels, which dogs don't do. But, um, let's see. Anyways, the second way that, that Brahmins are like, let's see, Brahmins are like dogs? Or let's see, five ancient Brahmin practices that are now seen among dogs, but not among Brahmins. In the past, Brahmins coupled with Brahmin women only when they were in season, not out of season. But now Brahmins couple with Brahmin women now, both when they are in season and out of season. Dogs, however, still couple with female dogs only when they are in season, not out of season. This is the second ancient Brahmin practice that is not seen among... So this seems to be implying that Brahmin women go into heat. Um, and women, humans, have what is called concealed ovulation. That <clears throat> human female doesn't just go into estrus that is that is obvious to men. And that's partly just because of pair bonding, it, it kind of just having sex whenever you feel like it, just it sort of causes a stronger pair bond, you know, increases the likelihood that the man will stick around when, you know, he's able to have sex with his woman when he wants to have sex with her and not wait until she's in season again. So this is, it's just, they're kind of weak arguments so far. Let's go to number three here. In the past, Brahmins did not buy and sell Brahmin women, and they would initiate cohabitation only through mutual affection, doing so for the sake of family continuity. But now Brahmins buy and sell Brahmin women, and they initiate cohabitation both through mutual affection and without mutual affection, doing so for the sake of family continuity. Dogs, however, still do not buy and sell female dogs. They don't buy or sell anything. And I just added that as commentary. Let's see. Dogs, however, still do not buy and sell female dogs, and they initiate cohabitation only through mutual affection, doing so for the sake of family continuity. This is the third ancient Brahmin practice that is now seen among dogs, but not among Brahmins. And I, mean, I don't think mutual affection has much to do with it. When, do when a female, when a bitch is in heat, the dog just, the male dog just goes crazy because of the smell and just wants to mate with her. I mean, he might just have no use for her at all any other time. It's not for the sake of family continuity. He doesn't even stick around for the kids. So, I mean, <laughs> this statement is made by someone who apparently is, is just using this comparison for rhetorical purposes without caring, you know, that it really is like a valid argument or not. But, um, or else they, he... It was somebody who really did not understand how dogs function. So anyways, I'll just move on to number four here. In the past, Brahmins did not store up wealth, grain, silver, and gold, but now Brahmins store up wealth, grain, silver, and gold. Dogs, however, still do not store up wealth, grain, silver, and gold. This is the fourth, fourth ancient Brahmin practice that is now seen among dogs, but not among Brahmins. You know, I mean, dogs just don't have personal property as a general rule. They might have, you know, a bone that they will guard, 
jealously or a favorite toy or something. Might have their their bed that they consider to be theirs or something. But I mean, this kind of argument is it's either for rhetorical purposes or it's just not very compelling logically. And anyway, number five, in the past, Brahmins went seeking alms food in the evening for their evening meal and in the morning for their morning meal. But now Brahmins eat as much as they want until their bellies are full and then leave taking the leftovers away. Dogs, however, still go seeking food in the evening for their evening meal and in the morning for their morning meal. This is the fifth ancient Brahmin practice that is now seen among dogs, but not among Brahmins. These bhikkhus are the five ancient Brahmin practices that are now seen among dogs and not among Brahmins. And that's how the sutta ends. <clears throat> and I mean, I would be surprised if the Buddha really taught that. That does strike me as something that, I mean, it's not particularly wise or inspired. You know, it's in a way, it's just sort of, dissing brahmins you know it's just saying that brahmins are supposed to be holy men and in the past they behaved like holy men but now they're not behaving like holy men and i mean there could actually be something like mr pranav was suggesting that hindus suggest that the buddha was against intercaste marriage although um i mean it's mainly just brahmins he's referring to and the, the main purpose is not to speak badly of intercaste marriage, but to speak badly of the way Brahmins are nowadays and just sort of picking some things that you can compare with dogs, I guess. But personally, I mean, it does not strike me as a particularly profound sutta. And the reasoning is pretty, pretty shaky reasoning. You know, it's, it's, it's not good, solid reasoning, in my opinion. So I would, I would consider that possibly to, I mean, either the Buddha didn't really say that or, I mean, he was just in a way just sort of, I mean, the point of the, the whole discourse would be just pointing out that Brahmins, they used to be holy men, but now they're not holy men anymore. At least lots of them aren't. And that is a theme that you find in the suttas elsewhere. Um, generally, I mean, in, in different ways, just pointing out that a true Brahmin is, is a holy man, that you're not just, a, you know, it's, it's something that you have to really earn or deserve, and that's not just something you're born with. So, yeah, it is weird. So let's see, what is the main question here? Why, why did the Buddha give such a weird discourse? Yeah, I mean, either he didn't, or he was just not in a particularly inspired mood that day and was just comparing Brahmins nowadays with dogs and, and pointing out that in some ways the dogs are superior. And, I mean, maybe it's possible. I mean, there's no way to prove one way or the other. But, um, I mean, it does remind me that one of my main teachers in Burma Pakoku Seattle used to refer to America as dog, dog nation, Kwe Nangan, because he said Americans live pretty much like dogs. You know, it's like, you know, they just go from one mate to another to another and have no respect for their elders and, you know, just live for the moment and live for sensual gratification and so forth. So, I mean, it could be a kind of argument similar to that, except specifically dissing Brahmins instead of Americans. But who knows, really? It is a weird discourse, though, and I do not recall having read that one before. So I'm just going to move on to Pranav's next question. Mr. Pranav, I should say. What are your thoughts on B.R. Ambedkar's views on karma? And he gave me this extended quote of B.R. Ambedkar with regard to karma. And he does say a few interesting things like, like kar karma is is considered to be a niyama, which is like a force of nature that that preserves order in the universe. But then, towards the end, this is a quote. Towards the end of this this extended quote, the law of kama has to do only with the question of general moral order. It has nothing to do with the fortunes or misfortunes of an individual. 
It is concerned with the maintenance of the moral order in the universe. And I mean, I could not agree with that. I do not think that that is the orthodox position of Theravada. There are plenty of suttas that really do refer karma to <clears throat> the fortunes or misfortunes of an individual, assuming, of course, that an individual exists. I mean, at the level of conventional speech at which individual beings exist, then certainly your own karma is going to be with it's going to be conditioning your fortunes and misfortunes. So why B.R. Ambedkar would deny that? Um, I mean, it's, it's pretty obviously going flying in the face of, of Orthodox Theravada. And it may be that uh, B.R. Ambedkar started his Buddhist movement in India more for political and social reasons than for spiritual reasons. Certain aspects of, of Buddhism, he just didn't have much use for, you know, it didn't serve his political and social purposes, maybe. Um, but it, it kind of reminds me of S.N. Goinka also, who had a very simplified, streamlined version of Dhamma that he would teach. And um, like his followers, I mean, that was good enough for them. And they thought he was he was great. But uh, if you want to get more advanced, you want to get into deeper levels of it, you have to leave that behind and get into the, the deeper levels and sort of leave the simplified version behind. So, um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure what B.R. Ambedkar considered Kama really to be. I mean, it's not really a cosmic force. It is a psychological phenomenon that karma literally is a mental state. And it's an individual mental state that refers to the individual. So for him to reject that, it, uh, yeah, I, I really, it's, it's certainly not orthodox. And I'm not orthodox either, but still I would have to reject what uh, B.R. Ambedkar says in this quote that I, that I mentioned. And so I'm just gonna move on to Mr. Pranav's third question, which is, which Jataka Kata is your favorite? Mine's Maha Janaka Jataka. And he's referring to Jatakas as, there. it's a, a genre of Buddhist literature. There is, the Jataka is one of the, one of the books of the Tipitaka. It's in the Kudika Nikaya. It's, it's a sutta collection. And, Technically, only the verses are canonical, that the stories, the prose stories that most people identify with the Jataka itself are, are commentary. And I've never really been into Jatakas. I've never really had much interest in Jatakas. And so I haven't read very many. Um, I guess one of my favorites is just the one that stands out the most where the Buddha is the Sasa Jataka, where the Buddha was a wise rabbit or hare in a previous existence. And I can't remember what is, he had two friends. One was a monkey and the other one was an otter, I think. And they were going to um, make offerings to a, a, a holy man mendicant that day. If, if they came across a holy man mendicant, and the other two animals, the monkey and the otter, I think they just went out and collected something. I think one of them actually stole something to offer to any mendicant that came begging. But uh, the, the rabbit didn't have anything. He couldn't really offer his food to a mendicant. So he just made the determination that if a mendicant came, he was just going to fling himself into a fire and cook himself and, and just as an offering to the mendicant, which caused Saka's golden or it's a, a throne of yellow stone up in Tawatimsa heaven to heat up whenever anybody makes this really radical ascetic determination or behaves in a very ascetic way it causes Saka king of gods his throne to heat up so he can't sit on it comfortably so he has to come down and deal with whatever whoever's doing this and uh, so he disguises himself as like a Brahmin mendicant and the rabbit just throws himself into the fire to offer his cooked meat. To, I mean, this scorched dead rabbit to this to this uh, mendicant or to to this god disguised as a mendicant, and the fire wouldn't burn him because Saka was 
protecting the rabbit because he was such a wise rabbit. And then as a reward for his piety and his determination and so forth, he squeezed the juice out of a mountain and, and drew a rabbit on the surface of the moon. And that is, I mean, if, if you look at the, the moon, it looks more like a rabbit than a face. You know, we see it as the man in the moon. Well, at least some of us used to. But if you look at it sideways, it really does kind of look like a rabbit. And that was the Buddha in a previous existence. So the Buddha kind of is the man in the moon. But, uh, I mean, I haven't read very many other ones. There's the, the one about the, the wise, what is it, a quail, I think. That there is, again, there, you had this wise quail. And he had two, two friends. One was an elephant and one was a monkey. And this, this whole story is canonical. This is found in the linea. So, I mean, that makes it kind of interesting to me because I used to be really into uh, linea or monastic discipline. <clears throat> and they were trying to determine amongst themselves who was the oldest, just so that the other two could pay respects to the elder. And the element says, well, you see that banyan tree over there? You, I can remember when I could walk over that and the top branches of it, the top leaves would just brush my belly. So he could remember when that banyan tree was just like a sapling. Then the monkey says, well, I can remember sitting next to that same banyan tree and I, I could like pick the fruit right out of the top while I was sitting on the ground. So he was, he was older because he could remember when the banyan tree was even smaller. But then the, the quail says, well, I remember eating fruit from a different banyan tree, flying over that area and pooping. And apparently my droppings had that banyan seed in it. And then the banyan, seed, the banyan tree sprouted from my crap. And so then they knew that the quail was the eldest of the three and the other two paid respects to, to the quail. And <clears throat> why it's one of my favorites is just because it's one of the few that really stands out in my memory. So, yeah, I mean, I don't really have any Jatakas that stick out in my mind as just being really inspiring. Some of them are just strange. I mean, a lot of them are just like Aesop's fables. You know, there's like the fox who finds a dead elephant and just kind of eats his way into the elephant. And then as the elephant swells up from its death, it kind of traps the, the fox inside. You know, it's just strange stories like this. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I don't know if I really have a favorite. I guess either the, the Sasa Jataka about the wise rabbit who tried to burn himself to death to, to feed to a feed to a mendicant. Or maybe the, the quail. But, I mean, it's neither one of them is really inspiring. I mean, there's there's not a whole lot of wisdom to be had from these stories. Uh, at least the ones that I can remember. The few that I have read. It's just they stick out in my mind as, as weird stories like Aesop's Fables or something. So I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from Five Precept Pete. And Five Precept Pete says, As a junior monk, did you engage in practice tudongs? of short distances and <clears throat> this is he's going with the thai the thai word tudong which is based on the pali word dutanga and dutanga literally is 13 optional ascetic practices that a monk can undertake like always sleeping in a sitting position or only eating alms food or only wearing a robe made out of rags or only, or just keeping three robes, not having any extra robes beyond those three. And just there, there's 13 of them all together, living in a cemetery, living under the open sky, living under a tree. And <clears throat> apparently what has happened is that in Thailand, they have taken this word Dutanga, turned it into Tudong, and it just means when a monk just wanders around. And in Burma, it wasn't easy for me to just wander around um, because I was this very conspicuous foreigner. So one time I was going to walk from Rangoon to the town of Wanduin, which is maybe 100 miles or so south of Mandalay. Altogether, it, was, it would be about a 400-mile walk, I'm pretty sure, at least 300 and I made it about 35 miles before I was essentially arrested and just interrogated, put in detention. And then one of my supporters was called and they had to come and pick me up and take me back to Rangoon again. So 
I found out that in order to do like long distance walking as a monk in Burma, I would have to avoid towns and roads and just go through the forest. I could walk through the forest. But of course, when you're walking through forests, there is no place to get food because a monk is not allowed to carry his own food, store it overnight. I mean, if, if a monk wants to eat something on a certain day, he's got to receive that food from a non-monk, you know, that same morning that he eats it. So I did do a lot of walking through like Alondo Kathapa National Park, <clears throat> just fasting while I did it. But walking like on by the side of the road in inhabited areas just did not work because the the immigration authorities and the secret police just did not want like conspicuous looking Westerners just walking around free. You know, they'd always say, we are concerned for your safety, but really they were just concerned for their own safety because they might get in trouble for just letting this weird foreigner walk around. So I guess uh, as a junior monk that I engage in practice two dongs of short distances um, to the extent that I was able to, I did walk around, but it was mostly out in remote areas and not, I mean, you couldn't walk through towns or anything. And it was even before the immigration authorities and the secret police caught up with me, it was, it was really awful because whenever I would slow down, whenever I would stop, crowds of people would just start accumulating around me, gawking at me because a lot of them had just never seen a Caucasian monk before. <clears throat> so yeah, it was, it, it really didn't work out very well in my case, but an Asian monk who looked, who could pass for Burmese. I knew a, a Vietnamese monk who did this. Also, I know an Indonesian monk who can do this. I mean, they can sort of blend in. They just look like a, a Burmese monk pretty much. They can just wander around wherever they want to, but I couldn't do it because I did not look like a Burmese monk. So I'll just move on to five preset Pete's next question here which is, would it have been allowable for you to walk as far as Bodh Gaya? Um, I know that there was an Italian monk back in the 1930s and 40s who actually did walk from Burma all the way to Bodh Gaya and back. Um, I think it was theoretically possible, but I don't know. It's I think it was illegal to cross the the Burmese border into India I mean, you'd have to get like special permits or something for it now. I mean, it wasn't all just British Empire like it was in the 30s and early 40s. <clears throat> so, I mean, it theoretically could have been possible, but I would have had to get all sorts of permits and visas and stuff to do it. And uh, I mean, it's the tropics. You know, I'm a shaven headed Westerner. My ancestors evolved to survive ice ages. Also, I've got like an oily skin type so that I have to pretty much bathe every day or I'll start breaking out in rashes and stuff. So that when I was walking, trying to walk from Rangoon to, to Wan Duen, I was going to walk along like, um, let's see, just walk along rivers most of the way, you know, at least try and find some place where I could bathe every day. And uh, yeah, I mean, walking around in the tropics, Caucasians, like pale skinned, Westerners, um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it doesn't work so well. There's, I mean, you can just wind up dead trying to do that kind of stuff. It, it wouldn't have really worked for me anyway. But I think technically, theoretically, it would have been possible. I think it has been done. So <clears throat> I'll just move on to Prop 5 Preset Pete's next question. Are any shoes or sandals allowable if a monk gets injured? And even if a monk isn't injured, he is allowed to wear thin leather sandals that are just a natural brown color. Um, they just have like one layer. The sole is just one layer of leather. Um, but he's not allowed to wear those in public. He's not aware, allowed to wear them in town or like among the houses. Um, but if he is injured, if he's got like a, a sore on his foot, or let's just say the pavement is so blazing hot you can't walk on it barefoot, then in a case like that, you would be allowed to wear sandals. It would be like flip-flops or, I mean, they'd have to be sandals so that 
because it's against the rules to wear shoes where your toes or your heels are covered. So, I mean, it would be essentially just sandals with straps and it would just have to be like a regular brown drab leather color. And they'd have to be like cheap sandals that are just like one layer thick. But what I wore was, uh, they were called Kopnat, which is car shoes, which they're made out of old car tires. And then, um, which is just like one layer of rubber anyway. And I would just sort of splatter a little bit of paint on them so they wouldn't be all black because sandals that are all black are not allowable. So I just get a little splotch of like white paint on them just so that they wouldn't be all black. And then they were, they were kosher. They were allowable to wear, but as a general rule, when I was a monk, I did almost the only time I wore sandals is when I went to uh, Pagan because Pagan has these these little spiky seeds all over the ground. And if you try to walk barefoot on the ground there, it's like you get like five of these spiky seeds stuck into one foot. And then you're standing on the other foot. And while you're standing on the other foot to pick the seeds out of the first foot, the other foot's getting like seven of these things stuck into your feet. And there's just some places you just cannot walk barefoot because of these little spiky, like caltrops or something that are just sticking into your feet. And uh, I think just about the only other time I ever wore shoes was if I was like trying to put out a brush fire or something. But shoes or sandals, I mean, shoes that aren't sandals just are not allowable. But sandals, if they're like cheap and not fancy by ancient Indian standards, are allowable even for a monk who isn't injured if he's inside the monastery or in an uninhabited area. And they are allowable for a monk if he has a health problem. You know, he's got an injured foot or like the pavement is so blazing hot, you just can't walk barefoot. Or there's these spiky little seed things everywhere or broken glass or something that you just can't walk barefoot on. So I'm just going to move on to the next question here. This is from SG. And SG says, with regard to comma, I have always been disturbed by the fact that we can see brain chemistry play such a big role in our actions and thoughts. For, for instance, I took a medication once that made me very aggressive and angry. How then am I responsible for some bad words or actions I took when I only did them influenced by some pill? Also, I could have been born with that brain chemistry and would go on to be a much worse person than I am. Can we really just say it was their karma to be born with a certain brain chemistry or to have their personality malformed by bad parents? Is it karma that the only thing that can help an illness is a drug that causes anger? Karma seems to be doing too much work and I don't see where the space for responsibility is. Well, for one thing, SG here is just assuming that physical matter is real. So brain chemistry, he would consider to be just as real, if not more real than karma, which is some is a hypothesis that I do not endorse. But with regard to, for example, taking a medication that made somebody angry, and then SG would like to, to assume that it's the pill that made him angry and not any kind of karma. But let's say, for example, alcohol. Let's just take alcohol for an example. I, I've known a few guys very quiet, mild-mannered guys, and then they get drunk and they just turn into just obnoxious monsters. And it's not just the alcohol making them obnoxious monsters. Not everyone who drinks alcohol is an obnoxious monster. Some people just become very, you know, friendly and happy and peaceful when they're drunk, you know, or joyful or whatever, or just clumsy. <clears throat> but, I mean, that anger was already in there. Just awaiting its opportunity to come out. And I think some, some drunks um, will use alcohol as a way of just sort of overcoming their inhibitions. You know, mo for the most part, they force themselves to be well-behaved. And, you know, it's just, they've got all this chaos that's, that's under the surface, just building up pressure. And then they get drunk and just blow it all out. Some people take ayahuasca for a similar reason. And so, I mean, the anger was already there when, when, when the pill was taken. 
I mean, it's like somebody like Neem Karoli Baba up there, I mean, he could take, I mean, he notoriously took 1,200 micrograms of LSD on one occasion, and it had no effect on him. He was so above that. He was so in control of his mind and everything. I mean, it just had no effect. And like a fully enlightened being who took the pill probably wouldn't be getting angry. So brain chemistry, I mean, the very idea that we even believe that we have brain chemistry is because of our karma. Our karma allows us to be indoctrinated or conditioned or taught with the idea that we've got brain chemistry that is influencing our, our behavior. So let's see. Brain chemistry. So here we go. Can we really just say it was their karma to be born with a certain brain chemistry? Yes. Or to have their personality malformed by bad parents? Yes. Because karma is determining or it's conditioning everything that you experience. That your mind is creating, is generating a kind of virtual reality in which you exist which includes your belief in brain chemistry. Before there was brain chemistry or before anybody knew about brain chemistry, still, I mean, karma was, karma was there. I mean, like conditioning our experiences. According to Abhidhamma, for what, for, for what it's worth, every sensation, every feeling that we experience is the fruition of karma. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's part of the problem in the West and increasingly even in the East is people just assume that scientific realism explains reality. And then if they adopt Buddhism, they just kind of like fit the Buddhism into the scientific realism as best they can, just as a kind of psychological thing or whatever. And it, I mean, it just generally doesn't work very well. It's, it's sort of like it's a handicap trying to you start off believing that science explains reality and science does explain samsara it explains the rules of this virtual reality but this virtual reality isn't really reality and even a scientist can tell you that the world as we experience it i mean that's not really reality there's a i wonder if i can find this without taking half an hour to do it but there's a really interesting statement by uh, Bertrand Russell that I copied out of a book one time. Let's see if I can find it. Let's see. Please be patient. Let's see. Bertrand Russell. Bertrand, see, I should I should prepare for these sometimes. Let's see. Bertrand Russell, come on now. It's not a very thick book. You can just bear with me on this, or you can just go potty really quick or something while I'm looking for this. Okay. Okay. No, that's not it. I think I'm, this might, I might actually have to just, let's see. Yeah, well, now I can't find it. That's not funny. Yeah, it's in there. But anyway, Bertrand Russell, in, in his book, I think it was Human Knowledge at Scope and Limits. And this was when Bertrand Russell was going through his scientific realism phase. He went through different phases. And at one point, he was just like, well, science is the best philosophy we've got. So we'll just go with that. And he was talking about when a, an astronomer looks through a telescope and he sees like this fuzzy white dot and he identifies that as a nebula just hundreds of light years away. It's really not so different from a neuroscientist looking at a human brain and, and seeing that and, assume, and considering that to be a human brain. Whereas, <clears throat> I mean, the nebula, just a fuzzy white dot that, I mean, we're not even seeing it as it is now. We're seeing it as it was hundreds of years ago because it takes that long for the light to get to us. And it's really the same phenomenon 
as the like the brain surgeon looking at a brain. You know, it's it has about as much correlation to reality as looking at a fuzzy white dot and calling that uh, a nebula or a galaxy. And I'm sorry, it took me so long not to find the quote in the book. Uh, so, SG. Let's see. I'll just, I'll just go over this question again. I have always been disturbed by the fact that we can see brain chemistry play such a big role in our actions and thoughts. Well, we believe that we're seeing brain chemistry. It is a belief. It's not actual knowledge. For instance, I took a medication that made him very aggressive and angry. Angry. How then am I responsible for some bad words or actions I took when I only did them <clears throat> under the influence of some pill because the anger was still there in latent form? You had the potential for that anger, which then was released by the circumstances of taking the pill. So you could have been born with that brain chemistry. Yeah, I mean, people, due to their, their karma from their past existences, presumably... They wind up in crippled bodies, messed up bodies, messed up families, abusive parents, all sorts of horrible things. But it's all conditioned by karma. There are some people, like some Buddhists will say, well, karma doesn't explain everything, but it explains a hell of a lot. So, can we really just say it was their karma to be born with a certain brain chemistry or to have their personality malformed by bad parents. Yes. So, I guess I answered that question. Uh, or towards the end here, it says, or I guess at the very end, it says, I don't see where the space for responsibility is. Well, most people, I mean, we always have a choice. It's just that most people are not awake enough or aware enough to realize that they have a choice. Let's say there's something that always pisses you off every time it happens. Every single time, if you are more awake, you would realize that you really do have a choice. It's just that you're reacting through habit, through a kind of knee-jerk reflex. You're, under, you're, you're being motivated by a kind of automatic pilot. But there's always the, the potential is there of rising above the knee-jerk reflex. It's always a volitional act, how you respond. And so, if you are more mindful, then you would be able to choose. If you are more awake, you know, more enlightened, then you could choose. Am I going to get angry about this or not? But most people don't get to that stage. They're just living their lives, just kind of acting out the automatic pilot. And so, whenever X happens... You know, they get pissed off or whatever. You know, it, it bugs them. And that's just the way it is. But, and that's, I mean, a lot of Western ethics and so forth just assumes that we have no choice when actually we do. That whenever we are unhappy, it's always a choice. It's always an option. And it's just that people are just so locked into their habits and not awake enough to realize that they do have a choice that they just are enslaved to, to circumstance. But really they are not. It's just, it's, it's just sort of like they don't, they're not aware that the prison door is unlocked. So I, I don't know. I'll, I guess I'll just keep going here and, and answer another question. This is from the Ottoman. And the Ottoman says, what's the difference between Nibbana and death? Well, death is something that happens to your body and your thinking mind. Whereas Nibbana, it's sort of like ultimate reality. Nibbana is reality. Death is something that is not reality. It's just something that happens in this virtual version of reality. You know, this, this semi-quasi-reality. Um, so Nibbana is, is ultimate reality. Or... I mean, as an ethical state, it's where <clears throat> you're fully awake. You know, it's like Buddha literally means awakened. So he woke up from the dream. So Nibbana is, you know, 
waking up from the dream and realizing ultimate reality. Whereas death is just, uh, you know, the, the virtual body breaks down, the virtual brain and mind break down, and then you just get a new one eventually, or the very next moment, I should say. So to a nihilist who thinks that when you're dead, you're dead. There's just nothing afterwards. Um, <clears throat> some people would say like Nisargadatta Maharaj did not believe that there was an afterlife. He just said, after you die, you just merge with Brahman. In which case, death and Nibbana would be pretty much the same. But <clears throat> science, scientific materialism does not accept Nibbana. And um, let's see, Buddhism doesn't accept that just when you're dead, you're dead. Just religion in general doesn't accept that when you're dead, you're dead. Other than maybe some kinds of like Judaism or something, like Old Testament Judaism, they seem to believe in the Old Testament that, uh, you know, when you're dead, you're dead. I mean, there might be an afterlife, but it was sort of like this gloom you just sleep through that you might as well not even have an individual soul anymore. So let's see. I guess I answered that question. And I wish my, my nostrils would stop doing this weird thing that they've been doing the last few Q&As. But that's the way it goes. So the next question is from Rui and Rui says, what is your take on the Buddha's proclamation of having discovered or rediscovered an ancient path? Well, <clears throat> the Buddha had enough wisdom to know that, I mean, he wasn't discovering anything new. There wasn't any kind of innovation. He was discovering what's always there. I mean, he was discovering reality and reality is always here. And he must have known that there were people before him that discovered it and there would be people after him that would rediscover it. So when in order to become enlightened, I mean, there are certain things like morality and renunciation and um, mindfulness that are just key to waking up. And it works the same for most people, at least most people that become enlightened on purpose. So... Yeah, I mean, it, it does make sense. I don't think it's anything really remarkable that the Buddha would proclaim or acknowledge that <clears throat> he just rediscovered something that other people had discovered before him and other people would discover long after he was gone. That I mean, it's just like this eternal principle that's always there. And every once in a while, there's going to be someone who just has the, the talent and the, the spiritual ripeness, the wisdom to be able to, to see that. So I guess I'm going to move on to the next question. This is from Cleefy. And Cleefy says, Buddha Dharma is a quite complex system. I am pretty sure I won't reach a liberation from samsara in this lifetime. Do you think I could stick to learning to be compassionate towards others and trying to be as wise as possible so I could ha leave as little of a mess behind me. But then if my karma allows, I will be reborn in a realm of semi-gods or gods. But as far as I understand, their realm is even worse for attaining enlightenment. Well, I mean, the main question here, the only question mark is, <clears throat> do you think that I could stick to learning to be compassionate towards others and trying to be as wise as possible so I could leave as little of a mess behind me? question mark. And yeah, I mean, that's what most Buddhists are doing, I think. I mean, most Buddhists, including most Buddhist monks, really have no aspiration to become enlightened in this very life. You know, they're just doing the best they can. They're, they're cultivating wisdom and, and virtue as well as they can to at least set themselves up better in, in, a ne in a future existence, in their next life. And if you wind up in heaven, I mean, most people after they die, presumably, it seems to me, are just born as people again. If you die with a human mind, you're reborn as human. If you die with an animal mind, you are reborn as an animal. If you die with a godlike or angelic mind, you're reborn as a god, a small g god. If you die with a demonic mind, then you can, might wind up in a demonic existence. So... 
most people die with pretty much of a human mind and so they wind up being human again <clears throat> so i mean you shouldn't avoid cultivating virtue and wisdom just out of fear of winding up in some advanced heaven realm where you'll have less inclination to practice dhamma i mean you wind up where you need to be so if you need to be a human again then you'll be a human again um yeah just do the best you can really i mean you shouldn't hold back on doing the best you can just out of fear of, of going to heaven and then just sort of being trapped in this in in millions of years of of celestial bliss and that's kind of kind of weird um so i guess i answer that question i mean it's, it's a fairly simple question even though it's it's uh, a little bit of a longish question, but the answer is short, which that's, that's kind of strange for me to have to answer a question in less time than it takes to read it. So I'm just going to move on to the next question here, which is from Master Poe. And Master Poe says, Buddha was a Yudabrao? Question mark. Hmm. Yeah, the nose is just not cooperating lately. It's only when I do these Q&As, though. It's just prolonged talking is starting to have this effect on my nostrils. So Master Poe, I think he's responding to a statement I made in the previous Q&A about how the Buddha had like this, this hairy spot, like where the third eye is supposed to be. But it wasn't a unibrow. And <clears throat> um, there is actually an obscure rule of discipline saying that someone with a unibrow should not be ordained as a monk. I mean, there's, there's this list of people that should not be ordained as a monk. And it's a pretty picky list. Anyone who's too tall, anyone who's too short, anyone who's too white, anyone who's too dark. You know, it's just anyone who stands out as unusual that might cause some kind of superstitious alarm in Buddhist lay people, like villagers, when this person is like walking through their village with his alms bowl. I mean, if, if he has... If he potentially could freak people out because of his appearance, then it's best just not to ordain that person according to these obscure rules of monastic discipline, which are usually ignored. I mean, I was way taller than, than the Burmese, although fortunately, I guess, I was ordained at the same ceremony with another uh, European guy who was almost as tall as I was. So we kind of compensated for each other. Um, so, I mean, the, the short answer to this question is the Buddha probably was not a unibrow. And the Thai monks just shave off their eyebrows anyway, although I don't think, uh, the ancient Indian monks shaved off their eyebrows, but that would have just made it completely a non-issue anyway. So I'm just going to move on to this question, which is from Nature Cure. And Nature Cure says, in your opinion, how much of Patimoka rules are Sila Bhattupadana and I assume he's, he means sila bata paramasa, which means just adhering to morality and observances. And I think what he furthermore means, uh, this is bugging me, just a minute. Man. Uh, I assume what he means is that how many of the Padimoka rules really are not ethics based and are more just like protocol based or um, etiquette based, you know, it's just or Indian, ancient Indian tradition based, you know, it's like um, wearing a robe that is discolored in certain ways. That's one of the Padimoka rules. A monk who, who is going <clears> to. <throat> wear a new put on a new robe he's got to discolor it first and i think originally that meant dyeing it sort of a drab color instead of you know bright white which is what a lot of lay people wore but it it got converted into this rule saying that you have to make a spot on this robe and it's called the bindu kapam and you're supposed to say imam bindu kapam karomi while you're making the spot which means i am making this spot and then that makes it allowable to wear after you make the spot. 
I think in Thailand, it's three small spots, but in Burma, it's more according to the commentary, the Winnie commentary is just one spot, which has to be at least as large as a bed bug, but no bigger than a peacock's eye, which I don't know if they're talking about like the actual eyeball of a peacock or the, like an eye spot on its tail. I'm not sure which. But um, how much of the Padimoka rules are Silabatu Badana um, or Silabata Paramasa? Well, all of them can be Silabata Paramasa if a monk clings to them. If he thinks that, you know, it's like he is better than other people because he clings to these rules. He follows them strictly. He has contempt for people that don't follow the rules. Um, that could be a manifestation of Silabata Paramasa with regard to all of it. Because even genuine morality, if you cling to it, is Silabata Paramasa. But if you're talking about uh, rules that really are not based on morals, you know, like there's a rule against, um, against killing animals. There's a rule against telling lies. You know, there's a rule against like verbally abusing another monk, that sort of thing, that <clears throat> those would be... Um, actual ethics whereas other rules you know like putting the spot on your robe or even just like drinking alcohol i mean if you have just one sip of something that's mildly alcoholic you know let's say one sip of some fruit juice that started to ferment not nearly enough to get drunk or anything i mean it's not really immoral but i mean I mean, that would be sort of like a borderline case or using water that might have living beings in it. So stuff like that. I mean, it's it's a lot of borderline cases. Um, like traveling by arrangement with a nun. I mean, the, that would not be particularly moral or, or immoral. I mean, it's just... Um, I mean, a lot of it is just ancient Indian tradition or it's just for the sake of appearances you know sort of like not ordaining somebody with a unibrow you know it's just something that might cause the sangha to look bad to its supporters and so all of the sekia rules towards the end would 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 fit into the the etiquette you know you're not supposed to talk with your mouth full you know you're not supposed to teach dhamma <clears throat> to someone who's walking in front of you down a path or you're not allowed to teach dhamma to someone who's walking on a path where, while you're walking beside the path. You're not allowed to teach Dhamma to someone whose head is covered by a hat or a turban, this kind of thing. It's just sort of etiquette. So how much of the Padimoka rules are Sila Bata Paramasa? Uh, I mean, I, I haven't done any kind of like analysis trying to separate out the genuine morality rules from the etiquette and tradition rules. Um, and then, of course, there are some borderline cases like drinking alcohol, for example, or just like sitting alone with a woman, that kind of thing. I mean, there's nothing necessarily immoral with regard to sitting alone with a woman, although for a celibate monk, it certainly doesn't look good. <clears throat> so, in my opinion, how much of the Padimoka rules? Um, I mean, the question itself is kind of, uh, open to interpretation. Like I said earlier, I mean, if you cling to the rules, then all of the rules are silabata paramasa, just clinging to morality and observances. But I think what Nature Q was mainly referring to is, you know, how much of the Padimoka is morality and how much is observances. And it might be probably more than half of it is just observances. You know, like a monk is not allowed to carry like goat wool more than a certain distance, that kind of thing. I mean, there's a lot of rules like that. He's not allowed to get a new bowl until his old bowl has a certain number of cracks in it. You know, that's, it's, it's not really a, a matter of ethics or morals. It's just making sure that the monks are austere and not, being a burden on their supporters and behaving properly in accordance with this ancient Indian spiritual tradition. So, yeah, I would guess that uh, 
less than half of it is actual morals. <clears throat> but I'm, I'm not going to try and make a guess. Maybe a third of it is actual morals, something like that. Maybe a quarter. Somewhere between a quarter and a third, maybe, would be actual morals as opposed to just observances, just sort of like tradition and etiquette and, and so forth. So I'm just going to move on to the next question. Also from Nature Cure, what exactly is Vichy Kicha, which is one of the three fetters, or you? Um, yeah, Vichy Kicha, it's usually translated as doubt or skeptical doubt. But obviously, not all doubt is a hindrance. Let's say somebody says, it's going to rain tomorrow. And you look around and it's just... It's sunny. There's no sign of any rain. You look at weather forecast and it says it's going to be sunny tomorrow. And then Bob says it's going to rain tomorrow. Well, just because you doubt that it's going to rain tomorrow doesn't mean that you've got this hindrance that's going to prevent you from becoming enlightened. So for me, Vichy Kicha, my interpretation of Vichy Kicha, and I think the way I have translated it when I have translated this word in a, in a text is indecision where you cannot make up your mind. It's like you've got two opposing points of view or two opposing desires that they're not resolved. You know, there's, if there's like this indecision that's holding you back. It's, it's sort of like, uh, I don't know, it's like a handicap for you. So that would be, that would be my interpretation of Vichy Kita is just indecision. So I'm just going to move on to the next question which is how would you describe Sakaya Diti? So we're getting lots of poly jargon in this one. So those of you who are beginners, I hope I'm not uh, totally scaring you off. If, if my five minutes of trying to find a, a Bertrand Russell quote didn't scare you off already. So how would I describe Sakaya Diti? Well, literally it means uh, it's like one's own body view. So Sakaya is like one's own body, and DT means view. But I think what it literally means is the view that you are an intrinsically real individual, that's separate from, from your environment. <clears throat> so I assume that's what it is. It's like individuality view. That's often how it is uh, translated, or personality view, that you are like... <clears throat> an individual that is just intrinsically, inherently separate from everything around you. That would, that would be my interpretation of Sakaya Diti, just the belief that you really do exist as an individual entity. And it is kind of wrong view. It is a kind of delusion. Man. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm really having trouble like breathing out. I can breathe in through my nostrils and then sometimes it just stops when I try to breathe out. It's not even funny. Ah. And then when a guy has a mustache, he's got to be careful about blowing his nose because sometimes stuff can wind up in your mustache that you're unaware of. If you catch my drift. So anyways, the next question is from Joe Doe. And Joe Doe says, if matter doesn't exist and everything is mind-made, would that make the formless consciousness one's attain, one attains in Nibbana, the formless consciousness that all so-called matter has raised from, would it make sense to call formless consciousness God and that attaining Nibbana is merging with God? Well, that's essentially the Vedantic view right there. That's like a lot of Hindus believe this. In fact, probably a lot of Christian mystics believe something along these lines, so long as they would, <clears throat> they could allow that, that the, the human spirit merges with God uh, at the highest state. But yeah, I mean, that's, that is, uh, that is like the Vedantic view that, <clears throat> that Nibbana or Brahman is infinite formless consciousness, which is like the essence of reality and samsara is just sort of a virtual manifestation of this this infinite consciousness and there are an infinite number of these these manifestations of, of samsara it's all called 
Maya in, in Hinduism, which is, I mean, just means like illusion. So, yeah, I mean, and you can call it God and that attaining Nibbana is merging with God. But in order to do that, you have to reify the absolute. You have to reify Nibbana as a thing, as an it. And Buddhism tends to avoid doing that. Nibbana is just off the scale. Anything you can say about it is going to be invalid. And so you're better off just not even going there. Not even trying to intellectualize the absolute because you can't really do it. The best you can do with the intellect is something like Nagarjuna does where you use ruthless logic to destroy all points of view, saving your own point of view for last and then destroying that last and then just leaving the kind of this emptiness that the Buddha was teaching. Just leaving that as just what's left over. So, yeah, I mean, that is more or less of a, a Hinduistic or theistic interpretation of of Nibbana and the sort of the goal of Buddhism right there. The main difference is that Buddhism tends not to reify the absolute, not to, I mean, it says as little about Nibbana as, as possible because anything you say about it is going to be invalid. Anything you say about reality is going to be invalid because you have to use words, which are symbols, and then you're just stuck in the realm of symbols and you don't, get anywhere near the reality, even though the reality is always right here, right now. <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm just going to move on to Jodo's second question here. Can any empty chair represent the Buddha's enlightenment? And it may be that he's asking this because I mentioned that before Buddha statues were invented, possibly by Greeks, that the Buddha was represented by a footprint or an empty seat or like a Bodhi leaf or some such, just to emphasize the fact that he had transcended samsara and he was no longer on the scene. He was no longer in this world. So, I mean, anything can represent the Buddha's enlightenment. Uh, that's the way symbols work. I mean, if you can somehow make a connection in your imagination between uh, an empty chair and the Buddha's enlightenment, if that is meaningful to you, then I guess you could go with that. But um, as a general rule, empty chairs generally do not represent the Buddha's enlightenment. And so I'm going to move on to the next question, which is a question maybe <clears throat> GameFap here was not expecting an answer to, is how can I be as big a boss as Panyo Basa? So it's kind of a play on words. Spelling bossa is a B O S S A, being a boss. And I don't know, because I don't really consider myself to be a boss. You know, I don't, I, as a general rule, I try not to compare myself with others. <clears throat> and so I don't know. I mean, maybe you can go and be a monk for 30 years or something. That'd be a start, I guess. But, I mean, you're going to have to do your own thing. You can, trying to imitate somebody else is uh, is not so good. I mean, it generally doesn't work out very well. Like, my, my main teacher, Pococo Seattle, he just tried to imitate Tom Pulu Seattle, even to the extent of wearing sunglasses at night, because Tom Pulu Seattle always wore sunglasses. But it, it doesn't make much sense to me. And I've got to blow my nose again. <laughs> Ah, yeah. Hope I don't have to take medicine or have to undergo some kind of procedure because of this. <clears throat> I don't like undergoing procedures. Let's see here, do the mustache thing. Ah, Ugh. Okay. So this next question is from Tig, and Tig is somewhat of a troll. In fact, he is a smart-ass punk. Yeah, you know who I'm talking to. And so he, he generally asks irreverent kind of borderline sacrilegious kind of questions. And so his question this time is what exactly is a pog? Is it a white girl that's pretty or a white girl with a pretty ass? Can a girl even be pretty without having a pretty ass? 
Or does it mean that the girl is actual, actually mid since she's pretty ass? Well, I mean, in Tig's case, I think a pog would stand for plastic Asian web girl because he seems to be pretty much obsessed with those. On the Discord server, he's continually posting pictures of these plastic-looking, often AI-generated, like, Chinese girls that he seems to think are dreamboats. But literally, POG, or P-A-W-G, I'm pretty sure stands for fat-ass white girl, with fat being spelled P-H-A-T. And it's like a, a genry of porn, I'm pretty sure. It's just, like, white girls with a big rounded butt, which has nothing to do with Dharma, <clears throat> as far as I know. And so I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from Outer Haven. And Outer Haven, uh, coincidentally, says, how can you overcome porn addiction from a Buddhist perspective? And <clears throat> that is, I mean, that's a... a a genuine question because a lot of people are porn addicts. Like when I was a teenager and in my twenties, I was pretty much of a porn addict. But back, back in those days, I mean, it was mostly in the form of magazines like hustler or something. They didn't have the internet back then, which is good, I suppose. But uh, how can you overcome it from a Buddhist perspective? Um, Buddhist approaches to overcoming lust in general tend not to work very well. I mean, there's certain things you can do to make you less lustful. And that's, you know, sleep less, eat less, you know, take cold baths, you know, the standard stuff along that line. And you can also like contemplate the, the foulness of the human body, which never really worked for me because I have a degree in biology and I see the human body as just like a miracle of engineering. You know, it's, I've, I've seen autopsies before and before I saw them, I thought maybe I was going to puke or something, but I mean, it was just fascinating. And I got this dog here wanting my attention, licking my hand. So <clears throat> let's see. So, I mean, like contemplating the, the various parts of the body, realizing that the rounded, smooth curves of a woman's figure are really filled out with this plasticky orange stuff that looks kind of like partially melted Velveeta cheese, subcutaneous adipose tissue, if you will. But as a general rule, it just doesn't work because lust is just built into us. I mean, just living the life of a monk or just maybe that might not be much of an option. But I mean, that's one of the main purposes of living the life of a celibate monk. But I mean, it's still, it's, it doesn't necessarily work very well. Like a coroner can like do autopsies on young women or the corpses of young women anyway, just every day or often, it generally doesn't cause him to be any less lustful when he comes home to his wife as a general rule. I'm just assuming that because it's just built into us. Um, years of conditioning, just sort of teaching yourself you know, this is wrong. I shouldn't be doing this. I mean, it can generally have a cumulative effect. <clears throat> but still, if there's going to be a lot of just friction and, and conflict and sometimes despair. So, um, yeah, from a Buddhist perspective, sometimes, I mean, I, I talked to this young American monk once who, um, not just with regard to porn, but with regard to lust in general, he said that he was like visualizing female rotting corpses swarming with maggots and so forth. And I mean, it just doesn't work doing that kind of stuff. I mean, it's, it's sort of poisoning the well, I guess, but still as a general rule, lustfulness is just kind of built in. So, um, I mean, you have, you have to change your perception and that can be done gradually through a lot of meditation and Dhamma practice and just, just being inspired to live a dharmic life so that when any kind of urge to look at porn, for example, arises in your mind, you're just not appropriate, not going to go there. And you just dismiss it immediately. I mean, that would be like the ideal state. And if you're really, you've really got a lot of faith or confidence in Dhamma, then you can do that. But then there's always going to be times when 
you know, maybe your meditation's not going well, you're sort of in a slump or something, you're getting kind of frustrated, then these urges just come right back up again. So, I mean, you have to realize that it's not serving you in order to stop it. Otherwise, you're just going to keep doing it. It's, it's like any other kind of addiction. I mean, one of the reasons why you get addicted to it is because you like it. So, to some degree, you have to really convince yourself that even though you like it, you're better off without it. And I mean, that's not easy to do to someone who's, who really likes something. And it may be for some people, it may be better just to, to just have porn in your own right hand than actually try to be in a relationship. I mean, that is, I mean, I, I've, I've considered writing an essay on that very subject, but uh, I never got around to it and I probably never will. But, I mean, it's not so much porn addiction as the problem from a Buddhist perspective. From a Buddhist perspective, it's like lust addiction or sex addiction with sex just being sexuality. You know, any kind of lustful behavior. So, how to overcome it. Really, the only way to overcome any kind of addiction is just really to become completely convinced, not 90% convinced, not 95 or 98, but to be totally convinced that it just doesn't serve you, that you're better off without it. And then it becomes pretty much effortless. But what is going to cause that shift in perception is hard to say. And like Carl Jung used to say, in order to replace some strong psychic force, like an addiction, um, I mean, you have, to, you have to replace it with something of equal intensity. So they used to say that um, the only real cure for dipsomania or alcoholism was theomania, or like finding Jesus. So you've got to replace the energy that was going into this addiction with something equally intense. So, I mean, if you have a real girlfriend, you have a real mate, then you won't need the porn, ideally, unless you really are addicted to it in a, a sense that isn't just, you know, wanting to be lustful, wanting to get some kind of gratification. So, yeah, it is, it is a tough one, I have to admit, because so long as you're not 100% convinced that you're better off without it, then there's always going to be times when you're just going to give in to the temptation. So just, uh, I mean, a stopgap, this sort of a jerry-rigged solution is just avoid any exposure to it. You know, it's like avoiding, like resisting temptation. You know, it's, it's just sort of like a, an inferior way of resist, resisting temptation by just avoiding the temptation. But eventually, you have to get to the point where even if the temptation is right in front of you, you can still resist it. And that's going to require a shift in your perception where you are fully persuaded that it's just not good for you and you shouldn't do it. But so long as there's a 5% or 2% of you still want to do it because you're not fully convinced, then it's still going to happen sometimes. And so I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from Bodhisatta969. And Bodhisatta969 says, I will be going to the Mutodia Forest Monastery in the Franconian Forest for three days in July. You only eat once a day there, and you have to follow the eight ethical rules. In your opinion, how can I use my free practice time effectively to make progress in the Buddhist teachings? <clears throat> well, um... Don't bring your phone or just keep it turned off. And probably the best thing you can do is um, just be mindful as much as you possibly can. Try to be mindful all day. You know, when you're not sitting in meditation, don't just go back into normal mode and just thinking all the time or whatever. It's just, you know, when you're done meditating, you have the, you're mindful of the intention 
to stand up. You're mindful of the intention. You're mindful of your motions when you're moving. Like if you're eating, you eat mindfully. You know, you're aware of the sight of the food, maybe the smell of the food. You're aware of the motions of your, your hand as you're reaching for the food. You're aware of like the, the hardness and solidity of the spoon in your hand. You know, you're aware of the food coming to your mouth, the intentions involved. You're aware of, you know, the chewing and the flavor and just the, the textures as it turns into this goo in your mouth. You're, you're aware of the intention to swallow and the swallowing. Just be aware of whatever is arising. Just sila uh, bata par no no not sila bata paramasa. What am I saying? It's uh, sadi pari sadi. Ah uh, man, I'm forgetting the word. Sadi is mindfulness. Sampajanya sadi sampajanya. So sampajanya is just full awareness. So that's when you you know when you turn your head, you are aware that you're turning your head. When you're reaching with your arm, you're aware that you're reaching with your arm. Just be aware of everything that you're doing to the extent that you're able to do that. Just be, a, just be mindful all the time. And that would be the best use of your three days at the, uh, the forest monastery. And of course, just you know, conscientiously you know, put your whole, you know, your whole spirit into it. Take it very seriously. So, uh, and good luck with that. And I'm going to move on to the next question here. This is from Extremely Rare Bird. And I'm going to blow my nose again. <laughs> I've been like the last three Q&As in a row. After talking for like an hour and a half, it gets to this point where <clears throat> I can breathe in through my nostrils and then it's like something plugs when I try to breathe out through my nostrils and it messes up when I'm talking. Anyways, uh, with that as an introduction, the next question is from Extremely Rare Bird. An Extremely Rare Bird says, Do you think the Buddha really hesitated to teach the Dhamma? I think it may have been a sort of exciting add-on to the story of his enlightenment. Why go through all that effort, eons of work supposedly, to become a fully perfected Buddha only to back out of his mission in the end. Well, before he was the Buddha, he wouldn't recall all of his past lives anyway. That, that occurred on the night of his enlightenment when he recalled all of his past lives and presumably recalled you know, all these eons of working on his, his virtues. So, let's see. Oh, yeah, because I guess he would be enlightened at this point anyway. So never mind. Just forget that I said that part. <clears throat> Do you think the Buddha really hesitated to teach the Dhamma? I mean, it is possible. I think the hesitation to teach the Dhamma may have been added to the story earlier than the whole idea of the Buddha striving for eons to perfect his virtue so that he could become a Samasam Buddha, which is just, you know, orders of magnitude beyond an order, ordinary enlightened being. That, I mean, it does make sense that the Buddha hesitated to teach the Dhamma when he, because, I mean, he hesitated to teach the Dhamma because he figured nobody would understand Padicca Samuppada or dependent co-arising. And, I mean, he was pretty much right. I mean, almost nobody understands dependent co-arising. But then, according to the, the, the legend, Mahabrahma himself comes down from a high heaven realm and begs the Buddha to start teaching this religion because there will be some people who understand Padicca Samuppada. And then the Buddha looked around with his clairvoyant divine eye and, and realized, yeah, all right, there's some people that will understand it. So, I mean, it could have been a kind of religious propaganda to have like the highest deity for the, the Vedic Brahmins come down and grovel before the Buddha and beg him to start teaching Buddhism. But uh, I can't understand that the Buddha would hesitate to teach the Dhamma, just going with the idea that most people would not understand dependent co rising because it's just too subtle. So, I mean, who can really know for sure? Who can say for sure? 
Uh, even somebody who thinks that they can look into the past and see what the Buddha did, maybe they're not even looking into the right past. Or maybe it's just, you know, their mind's playing tricks on them or something. So, I mean, in a way, he wouldn't back out of his mission. Um, I mean, he would have been just been a Pacheca Buddha. He would have been a fully enlightened Buddha. It's just that he would be like a hermit Buddha. So, I mean, whether his mission, you know, over countless eons was to become the founder of a religion, I don't think that would be motivating him nearly as much as just the desire to become enlightened, the desire to know reality. But, I mean, it's nobody can really say for sure to what extent these ancient legends are based on fact. I mean, you can't really know for sure. So I'm sorry to, to answer that with a kind of a nobody can really know kind of, a, kind of an answer. Uh, but I mean, that's just the way it is. Nobody can really know. So I'm just going to move on to extremely rare birds. Next question. Which is, how was it like when you first began to conceive of Nibbana actually being a reality? I have often thought in the past that Nibbana is too good to be true. Only now my deeply ingrained skepticism and suspicion is beginning to loosen its grip on me. Well, in my case, it, it was a little different. It's like as a teenager, I started reading spiritual texts, mainly at first uh, texts by Ram Dass, books by Ram Dass. I think Grist for the Mill was the first Ram Dass book I ever read. And um, it just intuitively struck me as, as right. So, I mean, it was inspiring to me. You know, it got me all fired up on Eastern spirituality. But, uh, yeah. But, I mean, I started to conceive of Nibbana actually being a reality almost as soon as I learned about Nibbana's existence. You know, it's like I started reading this Eastern spirituality stuff and just immediately it was just, it struck a chord with me. You know, it was like this intuitive, yes, this is this is this has got a lot of truth in it. You know, this is this is right. So, yeah, I mean, it inspired me to want to become a monk and renounce the world at the age of 17. So, yeah, it was it was definitely uh the whole experience of just being turned on to eastern spirituality at the age of 17 really did have a life-changing effect on me. Um so I guess I answered that question. I hope I answered that question. So I'm just going to move on to the next question, which is the very last question. And it always takes me by surprise. So the very last question is, if one accepts rebirth as a possibility, one could see Jungian archetypes as memories of infinite past lives one has already gone through because how else would we recognize them or understand their dynamics within the whole if we haven't experienced them to some degree before what do you think does this make sense well rebirth i mean jungian archetypes as memories of past lives i don't think it's really that it's that good of a fit because the way jungian archetypes work it's it's kind of like a symbolism or like almost like dream imagery so it's it's sort of subconscious symbols that are shared by all people you know the the collective unconscious as jung called it so <clears throat> i'm not sure that that would necessarily work if these jungian archetypes were memories of infinite past lives you know like 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 elves or little people as a kind of paranormal entities that, that live in forest and live in forests and mess with people sometimes um, I don't know how belief in that sort of thing, which is very widespread in the human race, would be the result of individual past life memories, which would be subconscious. So I think it would be more likely that the Jungian archetypes would be just a kind of dream symbol, like similar to dream symbolism. You know, like Sigmund Freud talked about dream symbolism, about how certain things 
if you dream about them, it has certain meanings for human beings in general. And it does seem to, to bear out for me, like dreaming about water is dreaming about spirit or religion. Dreaming about being inside of a building is often like a symbol of being inside your own body, your own personality. Like my father, when he got old, he said he started dreaming about being trapped in old dilapidated buildings. So, um, yeah, I don't think that that would necessarily follow from past life experiences that I just think that, um, the human mind is just evolved or constituted in, in certain ways so that we all kind of think in the same kind of symbolic ways, though at least there's a lot of overlap. And so certain beliefs like belief in Bigfoot, for example, you know, it's, it's found all over the world, you know, it's found the West, Western hemisphere, Eastern hemisphere, just, you know, all over the world, there's people that believe in something like Bigfoot. And I don't think that Bigfoot is some species of un, as yet undiscovered primate that, I mean, Bigfoot, you could say is, is a paranormal entity, but also it's like the, the willingness to believe in the sort of thing, which then opens up the door you know, with enough faith that you're actually able to perceive these things, even if they're coming through from a, like an, another dimension, like a parallel universe nearby or something, that still it's like this Jungian archetype of, of being like this is already kind of allowing them to come through because, you know, we have this receptivity to that sort of thing. <sighs> if that makes any sense. And I hope I haven't just butchered Jungian psychology. But it is my understanding that, that like Jungian archetypes are, it's just a symbol based on just sort of like common principles of human psychology and subconscious psychology that results in everyone sharing this deep kind of symbolism. And yeah, I, I would... I'm not inclined to attribute that to past life memories just because the past life memories would be on a different order, like along different lines, I think, I guess. And so that was it. I'm, I'm not sure I even answered that question very well, other than kind of, kind of giving my reasons for not really following the idea, but uh, that's it. And so if you have any questions, if you've lasted this long, you get to this point, you want to ask questions, then just put, include them in the, the comments below the video and like and subscribe if you have not done so already and uh, be happy. And now I got to stop recording. <laughs>